issue is with the soul. The battle of every believer is in that battleground area. The things that we put up with and fight with and contend with all the time in our mind it comes in through our flesh, through our eyes and ears, and we make decisions about it in our thinking. It comes out, and we make decisions, and it goes through our will in our soul and becomes a stronghold. And I want to take the opportunity to look at God's word today because um, in, a, in a thorough way because there's somebody in Scripture, there's several, but there's one specifically instance I want us to look at in history here in Second Chronicles chapter 20, and I'm going to read the whole of it, which goes all the way down to verse through verse 15. So if you have your Bibles, we'll start there, and I'm going to read the account of Jehoshaphat and how he overcame the enemy. Second Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 1. After this, the Moabites and Ammonites, and with them some of the Minuites, came up against Jehoshaphat for battle. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a great multitude is coming against you from Edom, far beyond the sea, and behold, they are in Hazzan Tamar, that is, in Gedi. Then Jehoshaphat was afraid and set his face to seek the Lord, and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah assembled to seek the Lord, from, to seek help from the Lord, from all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah in Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations in your hand are power and might so that none is able to withstand you. Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? And they have lived in it and have built for you in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, If disaster comes upon us, the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this house and before you. For your name is in this house and cry out to you in our affliction. And we cry out to you in our affliction. And you, hear, you will hear and save. And now behold, the men of Amnon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you have not let Israel invade when they came from the land of Egypt, whom they avoided and did not destroy. Behold, they rewarded us. They reward us by coming to us to drive us out of your possession, which you have given to us to inherit. O oh, our God, will you not execute judgment on them? For we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Meanwhile, all of Judah stood before the Lord with the little ones, their wives, and their children. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, son of Benaiah, son of Jael, uh, son of Matiah, in the Le a Levite of the sons of Asaph, in the midst of the assembly. And he said, Listen, all Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem, and King Jehoshaphat. Thus saith the Lord to you, Do not be afraid, do not be dismayed at this great horde, for the battle is not yours, but God's. I got seven emails this week and some phone calls, a couple of phone calls from a handful of you here that are struggling with different things. Last week, set some, maybe some scales came off of your eyes. Some of you have felt liberated and that God is working in your life, and I praise God for that. There are people in this room that um, you struggle with some addictions that you haven't been able to kick for many years, some 40 and 50 years, as one person told me. And having fear and anxiety, some have in your life that you spoke to me this week, and, and if there's just a few of you that said it, I know that there's probably others, that we hang on to these anxieties and these fears, and, and we, we let them fester, and they, they run deep in our soul, and they abuse us, and they hurt us. I spoke with someone who watched online, which was a blessing this week, and said that their anxiety was so great that in life they could hardly function. The basic things of even preparing food was difficult for them. Another man that I know just uh, uh, about a year and a half ago uh, came into such depression that he physically just could not take care of himself because the anxiety in his life was so overwhelming and the fears had so succumbed him that he was unable to function. And many people in life uh, struggle with greed and anger and anxiety and, and depression and, and all of these things. And I want us to know something today. If we learn anything from King Jehoshaphat, the battle is not yours, it's God's. The good news for us today is that Jesus has already won the victory. The battle is won. The war is finished. We are in these skirmishes in the soul 
and we're going to be in this war in this life in all kinds of ways, but the fact of the matter is Jesus has won the war. On the cross, when he said it is finished, he didn't mean that it's almost done. Wait for so-and-so's fears to be overcome, and then it'll be done. Or wait for so-and-so's anxiety to be demolished, then it'll be overcome. When he died on the cross, he said, it is finished. I don't want us to misunderstand. We are still involved in this battle, but our participation is all 100% the degree of being able to surrender to the Lord. Jehoshaphat was king of Judah, and at this point in history, King uh, Israel and Judah were at odds as was most of the time when the righteous kings were in Judah, and Israel kept to see, to, keep to uh, seem having all the same e evil coming up time and time again through generation to generation, and, and, and Jehoshaphat uh, was a righteous king at this point. In fact, he began that way, but he had, he had to break the chain even from his own father, King Asa. Asa had his good moments, and there were times he sought the Lord, but in the end he reverted back to his own strength more than God's. Once God even spoke to Azariah too, King Asa, who was Jehoshaphat's dad, and he said, hey, if you seek the Lord, you'll be, fine by, you'll be found by him, but if you don't seek him, he won't find you. Right? Another time, um, Haniah came to King Asa, and he said, God looks everywhere on the whole earth to find someone who's going to seek him whose hearts are fully committed to him. And uh, he said uh, Asa was physically ill at the, long, at the time, and, and uh, he was angry that the, the prophet said, you're not doing that. So Jehoshaphat was supposed to break the chain, and the chain was impressive. Chapter 17 says that the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because in his early years he walked with God and in the ways of his father David, and it, he pushed aside the traditions of his immediate father, King Asa. He didn't consult the false gods of Baal, and, and he followed God's commands. And the war that has been going on with Israel came to a point of chaos, but, but it, God gives Jehoshaphat this great victory over Moab and Amnon, and he did this in a, the most amazing way. How did it happen? Jehoshaphat followed a battle plan that ensured victory. Number one, there's a battle plan that we can follow that so identifies with this and so perfectly on. Number one, we need to identify our tormentors. The scripture says the Moabites, Ammonites, and Minuites came to make war with Jehoshaphat. The Bible says that it was a vast army, overwhelming. Anybody here ever been overwhelmed? Oh, never. You're all liars if you didn't raise your hand. Okay. Oh, the Bible says all liars. Uh, we want this. Okay. You've been overwhelmed. I know you have. I've been overwhelmed before. Friends, the enemy's goal is to make us feel overwhelmed so that there's no escape. The strongholds that we fight with in this life can make us feel this way, but what does Jehoshaphat do? First of all, he identifies as tormentors. Now, Jesus tells a parable in Matthew chapter 18, in beginning of verse number 23, and he talks about two guys that owed people money. The first guy owed his master a million bucks. And, and the master says, okay, this, is, this guy's not paying me back. Bring him in. They bring him in. And the, the master says, I'm going to throw you in jail. I'm going to throw you in prison. You and your whole family, uh, you know, until this debt is paid. This is ridiculous. You're, you, you're, this is, you're behind. There's no way you're going to ever do it. And the, the servant feels like, oh, my goodness, how could I possibly pay this money back? And so he falls down, and he, he, he says, oh, please, won't you forgive me this debt? I, I have mercy on me, he says. And the master says, he has compassion on him, right? He says, you know what? I'm going to have compassion. So the guy gets up, and he's feeling good about himself, but he goes out, and he finds some guy who owes him 20 bucks, right? And he, he, has, he tells the guy, give me my 20 bucks, and the guy says, I don't have the 20 bucks, and he does the same thing. To him, he says, have mercy on me. I'll give you the 20 bucks as soon as payday comes around. This is the Larry Ellis version, L-E-V. It's not, you know... NIV, NAS, New King James, or Revised Standard, or whatever. Okay, this is L-E-V -E 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 version. It's a really good one. I read it sometimes. Anyway, but he comes in, and he, he's, he, he says to this guy, who was in 20 bucks, forget it. He has him thrown in jail and, and all this stuff, the same thing that the master was going to do to him for owning the million dollars, but he had mercy on him. Well, the master hears about this, and what does he do? We find in verse 32, it says, then summoning him, his Lord said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And this Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers 
until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive your brother from your heart. First of all, who's Jesus speaking to? Well, the disciples come and he's responding to Peter's question, how many times will I have to forgive? Seven times? Seventy? How many times do I have to forgive, Jesus? How many times do I have to really take care of this issue? So Jesus is speaking to the disciples. His father says, literally, to the, the followers of Jesus, you and I, if we're following Jesus, that I will put you, allow you to be under tormentors until you forgive, until you let go of that stronghold. Not just an outward display, oh, I forgive you, and then walk away and harbor the resentment. This is the foundation of strongholds because all contention comes from pride. Proverbs 23.10 says, contention is the source of all pride. Pride is the source of all contention. There, there is nothing else. That is the foundational principle. Every battle we fight is because of pride. We say that we can do this on our own. We surrender the ground of our soul to habits, addictions, and, and fears. And we wind up harboring and protecting and feeding these things. And, and Jesus uses the word here to us that he, the, the Father, will give us over to tormentors. The word in the Greek means that, a torturer, a tormentor. Why? So that we will surrender the stronghold and that, there will be, that, that we would undermine the work of pride. And there's a lot of tormentors in this life uh, from Proverbs 3.13, 1 John, Proverbs 15, all throughout Scripture. I mean, all these are Bible-based, but the demonic tormentors of poverty come on those who, abs who are absorbed in sensuality. The Bible says if they have a lustful spirit, they spend all their energy on sex so that they're poor in money and poor in spirit. The tormentors on loneliness come as a result of unchecked bitternesses that we have. Broken relationships or hopes unfulfilled are just a couple of examples from 1 John, tormentors of misdirected anger. No one wants to be around an angry person, Scripture says. And the Bible says in Proverbs 15, 18, and 29, 22 that they're eventually without friends because they're angry all the time. The tormentors of hopelessness and suicide come when we allow our hopes to be invested in people rather than God or substances rather than God, all things that, that we love rather than the things of God, Isaiah 2. Tormentors of abuse and emotionally and physically can come on those who are suffering the constant barrage of addictions. They rob a person of strength when substances are gone on and, and they feed the substances more than they do the Lord. 1 John 2, 16. Tormentors of fighting and brawling come on those whose sin is with uh, misdirected anger as well because they're, they're, they're through, it lashes out through pride. The tormentors of fear and depression come when we misplace hopes in people and things rather than God. When people are gone and the resources are all used up, everything we, that we hope for comes crashing down all around us and we sink we sink into depression and fear Isaiah 41 the tormentor of rebellion comes when authority is rejected and the foundation of pride builds a stronghold there fits of rage come out lack of contentment comes out and even laziness will follow all of these things are biblical principles that are tormentors why to hurt us maybe a little bit but hopefully to get our attention right this is important because I think it leads us to understand if God is willing to do this in our lives as we harbor things and he is a loving God and he cares for us, then we need to really learn what the enemy's schemes are. The schemes of the enemy are clear. Ephesians 2, 1 tells us, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins and once you once walked, I think we got this, don't we? Once you once walked, here we are. There we are. We're catching up. Once you once walked, following the course of the world, following the prince of power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. No, the word once is always in there. When you're saved, you belong to God. Right? Verse 3, among whom we once lived in the presence of our flesh, carrying out the evil. Uh, desires of our body and the mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So what are the things here that attack? The Bible say, uses the word world. 
the course of this world. So the enemy uses the ways of the world, the demonic exploits of it, that are in culture. Culture is a huge draw, right? I mean, media is a big thing. Music and movies and, and stuff is constantly preaching the, their righteousness and their version of, of what they think truth is. Then he uses the word Satan, the actual devil, the power of the prince of the air, the mastermind of the demonic realm. Satan is not omnipresent, so he uses all these this his unholy horror to to carry out these things. So so he needs help administrating the temptation that causes bondage. And then thirdly, the Bible tells us Paul writes it the flesh, gratifying the needs of the sinful nature. Our own flesh is perhaps the greatest and most powerful enemy that we can have to our soul. Remember, Satan didn't create sin himself. In fact, he fell to pride. So that stronghold of pride, that underlying premise is the thing that we want to uproot. How does this happen? How do these things get into our soul? Well, number one, if we're lazy, we leave familiar sin laying around so long that we don't realize it's still a factor. It becomes our buddy. It becomes our friend. We're so close to it that we don't even realize that it holds us back. In fact, you know the saying, if you tell yourself a lie long enough, eventually you'll believe it to be the truth. This is exactly what happens in our lives. We, we leave familiar sin laying around. It's like, oh, it's no big deal. I'm just going to leave this out there. All of this, these little seeds that I got planted, they're okay. We get used to being around them. We become very familiar. Secondly, we rationalize our sin by saying it doesn't affect our walk with Jesus. Oh, I only get drunk on paydays, but I still come to church and feel the spirit when we sing that one song. Or I can witness to that person that I hook up with every once in a while, you know, pillow evangelism. I invite them to church. If we rationalize our sin, we realize the power of, we won't ever realize the power of God's freedom. Rationalization is easy with any of us. Oh, I'm okay with this. I allow this in my life. I allow that in my life. But you know, I can still follow Jesus. Friends, no, you can't. Following Jesus means following Jesus. The question is not are you a Christian, are you following Jesus? Thirdly, do we feed our spirit with God? We do not feed our spirit with God things. We continue to nurture and harbor sin. We, we make sin safe. The battle is in the soul. It must be subject to our revived spirit now. The spirit must put into subjection, in a foothold, in a, in a submission hold the soul. Your born-again spirit must command the soul and say, this is not what pleases the Lord. I want to change this about my life. I have all of these things, and, and, and you must listen to me now. Number four, we surrender the ground to the enemy, and it must be taken back. If we're going to follow Jesus effectively, friends, and you have that one thing that's been harboring in your life, or you've been holding on to that one temptation, you find yourself going back to it over and over again and falling into it, and the guilt overwhelms your spirit, and it makes you feel so awful. Friends, today is the day to break the chain. By the power of the Holy Spirit, this is possible. What happens at this point is when we surrender ground in our soul, it gives the devil a stake in the ground to build his building. And the word that Paul uses in 2 Corinthians 10.4 is the word stronghold. Now, in the Greek, it means it, it's figuratively and, and literally means a castle, both figurative and little. A stronghold, a, a foothold into a piece of ground. And the other word that's used to help define it is argument. And I find that very interesting because if we look at what a stronghold is, it's basically an argument in our soul. The, the imagery is very strong. There's a picture of a castle that I get established in our soul. And, and what is a, the stronghold? It's an argument. It's a defense of itself. It's a, it's a stronghold. It doesn't want to let go. And, and what happens is that we defend our position. We, we like our sin. And a stronghold is a habit that you cannot break, something that you find yourself coming up against time and time again, that lustful spirit, that greed, that pride, that arrogance, that, that fear, that anxiety, that hopelessness. It's sort of like a checkerboard. I, oh, there it is. Now it's ahead of me, right? The checkerboard is a great example. How many have ever played chess or checkers? I mean, everybody right. 
especially chess, there's, there's real strategy to the game. I used to play chess with my dad when I was a kid in fourth grade. He taught me how to play. And um, then he would come home after work, and I had been thinking about this all day, right? And I'd, I'd play. He was exhausted. Until he, st- he played me for a long time until I started beating him, and he quit. But, you know, I took advantage of his weariness. The thing that's so impressive about this is that all of these areas of our soul, God has established things, and his word establishes things. Faithfulness, strength, boldness, goodness, love, hope, patience, honor. But then the enemy comes in, and we surrender some of the ground. If the checkerboard is our soul, we surrender some of the pieces of the ground. We, we give up to jealousy. We give a foothold to anger. We, we, we give a foothold to guilt or anxiety, lust, fear, greed. And these things come in, and these are the things that you're going through in the small groups. The book that I wrote for our small groups is, is focused on these five things specifically. If we look at this checkerboard, all of our addictions or our passions and the thinking all comes from our soul. Now, every single one of these strongholds has a flag, and above lust on the flag is, is pornography and, and, and laziness, even, the Bible says. So explore the idea of lust is to expound it to what flies in the flag. The flag represents what's coming out, but the stronghold, the foundation, is lust. So the flag might say all kinds of things with, with uh, greed, it might be stealing and, and, and taking others' money and, and selfishness. All of those things might be flying on the flag, but the foundation is greed. Guilt. Uh, over top of guilt is, is, is um, uh, separation and loneliness and all of these things that come will be flying the flag, the outer, but the foundation is guilt. Anger, the same thing, misdirected anger. Anger, fits of rage could come out. There could be a short temper. There could be all of these things flying on the flag. And so we look at the castle, and what do we do? In order to defeat the castle, the thing that we see is instead of getting and addressing the anger root, the stronghold of anger, misdirected anger, what do we do? We, we try to develop habits to deal with our fits of rage. We put us on medication to make us calmer. We do all kinds of things to try to deal with what's flying on the flag when the real problem is the foundation. Remember, the foundation of all of it is pride. Only by pride comes contention. The way of the world is to keep going with the flag, our behaviors, the tormentors, the surface issues. These are the tormentors. Uh, You know, uh, impatience uh, uh, comes from um, anger. Um, Fits of rage comes from anger. From jealousy comes all kinds of reactions that we have with people, and we deal with those surface issues when God is looking to uproot the stronghold. God desires for us to take these strongholds out And then we'll see our behavior change. And this is the battle that's in the soul. And too often we deal with the flag flying rather than the problem. Number two, we need to deal with the enemy's limits. The enemy has limits. Did you know that? And as children of God, we need to remind him of what those are. You know, Jehoshaphat knew his enemy could not possess the land because God had given it to them. Did you hear me? Jehoshaphat knew the enemy could not possess the land because God had given it to him. Look at his prayer in verse 7. Did you not, God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before the people is of Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, and, have, and, and they have lived in it and built for you a sanctuary for your name? Christians cannot be owned or Possessed by Satan. Jesus says in Matthew 12, 15, or his demons, that a person cannot help both the spirit of God and the spirit uh, uh, of demons in their body at the same time. Paul also tells the Corinthian believers that an evil spirit cannot occupy the same space as the spirit of God in the same temple. So, friends, God has given you, given every single one of us a soul, and he gave us that ground. And if we want to live in the freedom, the power to take back that ground, we have to, re- we have to remember that we've surrendered it in the first place. The enemy has no claim there. 
He has no claim because God has given it. You have been bought with a price. God gave you that soul. The enemy has no rights to God's property. Secondly, I think we need to understand our weaknesses. Now, Christians can be, even though we're not possessed by Satan or the devil, we can be troubled and influenced by demons and evil spirits and our flesh. Paul goes so far to say that as Christians, the, in Romans six twelve, he says, Christians can actually let sin reign in their mortal members. Christians can and do ignore the sin that we must deal with. In Ephesians 4, it says, do not give the devil a foothold. The word there is stronghold as well. Paul tells the t- t- Timothy that Christians can be given, given over to be, quote, captive to do Satan's will in 2 Timothy 2.26. Colossians 2.8 tells us that Christians can also fall into the trap of the philosophies of this world. These are amazing revelations because it means even though that we're born again, our spirit belongs to God, we still have these strongholds potential in our life. This is really important. I think we need to understand this. But Satan doesn't own that ground. It belongs to God. Thirdly, number three, exchange your weapons for God's armory. This is where the rubber meets the road. How do we do that? Number one, we've got to starve the stronghold and feed the spirit. Scripture says that Jehoshaphat was alarmed. Use the word alarmed there. The idea of the enemy coming to take over what God has given or destroying us, what, what would that do? How many remember that old movie, Red Dawn? Remember the, the original, they did a remake, it wasn't any good. But the, you know, the one with Patrick Swayze and... Uh, remember, in, in the, they come in from Cuba, I think, right? The communists come in, and they, they're going to take over, and these group of high school kids get some guns and stuff, and they go up to the mountains, and they start they a little terrorist unit, you know, and they start attacking here and there. Finally, in the end, they, most of the, all the stars die, but, you know, well, if you've never seen it, I just ruined it for you. But um, <laughs> anyway, could you imagine being under a communist government? Freedom to move being removed, churches being removed, liberties being taken away, the, the freedom to, for a, a pastor to say from the pulpit the things of God or the, the truth of God's word without being scrutinized or, or um, like the progressive movement would have us do today. I gotta say, this is why Jehoshaphat was alarmed. He was alarmed because the enemy was coming into a place that God had given him. God had already given it to them. And friends, I think today we need to get a little alarmed. We need to get a little bothered. We need to get a little upset because the enemy wants to keep you in your stronghold. He wants to keep you in your anxiety. He wants to keep you in your fear. He wants to keep you in your doubts. He wants to feed that thing with the culture, the world, the enemy, the devil, and your very flesh. This is his strategy. And what does Jehoshaphat do? He calls a fast. He calls a fast. You know, at the end of March, we're going to do 11 days, uh, starting March 31st, Sunday, that last Sunday of the month, and we're going to go through a week and a half on land on Wednesday, and how we're going to have worship and prayer every day. And so I encourage you to be a part of that. But part of the, re- the reason for a fast was what? To deny yourself the necessary food. They were saying to God, God, I'm going to lay aside everything that I want, even what my body wants, what my flesh wants, what my mind wants. I mean, how many have ever had just, uh, you know, an appetite? You're not hungry, but you have an appetite. I know what it's like. You sit there watching TV, and here comes a big flash of a big piece of chocolate cake and ice cream. I'm getting up, and I'm, what am I doing? I'm going to the fridge. I'm going to find something that's similar or something that's going to satisfy because my appetite's been, and they said, we're going to set aside our appetites because we want an appetite for God. And Jehoshaphat calls a fast, and all the people start praying, and they, they, they start seeking God. He says, we're going to trade what we want for God, your intervention. You know, after Christmas, I put on all this weight. In fact, last week I was watching the video after it was posted online. I go, is that me? Boy, I got a, I look bad. I'm sure nobody else has ever done that. Told me that I look bad, but I mean, <laughs> I said, you know, there's something I'm going to have to do about this. I'm going to have to develop better habits. And it took me a little bit to get back up to three and a half miles in an hour on the trail. It took me a while to, you know, to, to work these things back in my life and, and to quit eating so much bad stuff. And it, it wasn't the ice cream and the pizza. It was me, right? I'm the battleground. The pizza is not guilty. <coughs> in fact, there's going to be pizza in heaven at the marriage supper of the Lamb. I jest, of course. 
I knew my weaknesses, so I had to change what I was feeding. We need to change what we're feeding our spirit, friends. The battle belongs to God. We need to trade in our, arm, our weapons for God's armory. Ephesians 6, Paul lists the uh, weapons of our war that we put on, and they're all illustrative. And, and he t- says, taking up the sword of the spirit, which is what? The word of God. The more we put God's word and defeat our spirit, it, it begins to dominate the soul. It begins to uproot and confront those strongholds because the mind thinks differently. It's all because of the transformation of the mind because the word, which is the sword of the spirit, we don't fight like the world fights. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. The, wor- the word says that we have healing. We have God's provision. We have, it gives promises and it begins to exercise the soul. It begins to say, hey, you've got to get with the program, fat boy. You've got to get on the treadmill, uh, Mr. Obese. You've got to take off this weight or the temptation will be there. No one likes to be starved to death. The soul will scream, no, don't do this to me. I like this. Some even like their bitterness. What else am I going to do to fill that hole? Some like their anger. What else am I going to do? How am I going to react now? Some like their lust. What am I going to do when I'm all alone and the computer's there and I've got all this time? How many times have I heard, number two, be accountable and correctable? How many times have I heard people say, yeah, I want to be accountable, but they're not correctable? That's fine, but they go hand in hand, friends, if we're going to follow Jesus. Following Jesus is best done together. That's the reason for all of our groups. These are the reasons. As iron sharpens iron. Hebrews says that we don't give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but all the more as you see the day approaching. If you're not in a group, well, that's your problem. But nonetheless, we have them. You need your church family, and your church family needs you, not just to hold you accountable, but to help you be correctable. When you are out of fellowship, When you're out of the worship service, when you're out of hearing God's word, when you're out of a small group, it is more difficult, not impossible, but difficult to walk in the victory without constantly going back to the pig pen. Thirdly, we fight with God's weapons. 2 Corinthians 10.2. I beg of you that when I'm present, I may not show the boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. Verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion that raises itself against the knowledge of God, the understanding, and take every thought into captivity to obey Christ, being ready to punish. You get this? This is like preaching material to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Look at all the equations here. Aren't they beautifully laid out in such wisdom from the Spirit of God? What power? Divine power. Not your power, not just to, not, not your strength, not your ability, not your talent, not your strong will, but the weapons of God give us the power to, defo- to destroy strongholds and their divine weapons. The word here is to demolish. I think it has a meteor meaning to it. It's just it not just to destroy, but to totally obliterate, to remove. You know what Jehoshaphat did? He laid down his sword. Now, if you're going to battle, you would think that you'd keep your weapon, right? He lays down his sword, he lays down his battle plans, he fasts, and he gets a men's choir together. Now that's what you need on the front lines. There's no sword. There's no other strategy. How does he win? With a men's choir. Read it. That's exactly what happens. He gets the singers together. Look at this, 2 Corinthians 20, verse 21. And when he had taken counsel with the people, he 
appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and praise him in a holy and holy attire as they went before the army and say, give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever. And when they began to sing and praise, the Lord set an ambush against the men of Amnon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were routed. For the men of Amnon and Moab rose against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, devoting them to destruction. And when they had made an end to the inhabitants of Seir, they all helped to destroy one another. They were confused. They started beating up each other. And what is Judah sitting back there? What's Jehoshaphat doing? They are sitting up on top of the hill laughing. Friends, I think this is the reason for Lindy's laugh last week. Come on now. When we see God win, when we know that he is the winner, when he, no, we know he is the victor, we know that he is the champion, why do we default to our own arguments? Why do we go back when we walk out the doors of the church thinking that was a great sermon, I feel inspired, I'm not going to open my Bible the rest of the week, I'm not going to be in fellowship with other Christians, I'm only going to pray before I eat lunch, and that's going to be it. Why do we have these worldly habits to feed our strongholds and not the things of God? I'm just asking. I'm as guilty as the next person. I know it's, we're busy, but you know, God's not surprised that you got an alarm clock. He's not surprised that you have a day planner. He's not surprised by the things that you have to do. We've got to turn the table on the enemy. We've got to take out uh, the sword of the spirit instead of being pursued. Then we pursue. Notice what it says. We become the hunters. We become the enemy of the enemy. We need to understand that Jesus has won this war. He has already won the battle. He has conquered sin and death. He has decimated the plans of the enemy. We don't have to walk under the oppression of the enemy. We don't have to walk under the anxiety or fear of the enemy. We don't have to surrender him that ground. It does not belong to him. No weapon formed against you, the Bible says, will prosper. Those that rise against you will fall. He, the Bible says, James says, to submit to the Lord, and what? The devil will resist him, and he will flee from you. We walk in the victory of Christ, friends. Our spirit is alive in Christ. He who the Son sets free is free indeed. Every curse, every curse, the Bible says, is broken. You are not under a curse. You are not under the law. You've been redeemed by the Holy Spirit. You are a child of the King. That ground of your soul, those wars that you fight, they're going to be there. But Christ has won the victory. In the name of Jesus, he says, every knee will bow. Every tongue confess that he is Lord. No more bondages to fear. No more bondages, friends. No more surrendered ground. <coughs> I'm tired of the enemy attacking my family. I'm tired of the enemy attacking my church. I'm tired of the enemy capitalizing on those weak areas. I'm tired of the, the, the church being like the lone water buffalo with a pack of lions taking them down. I'm tired of this. I should be tired of it because the, the lion of the tribe of Judah has conquered. It's time to trade our armor in for a choir of men. It's, it's time to exchange our battle plans for the word of God. It's time to quit being filled with the lies of the enemy and be filled with the spirit. No more bondage, no more fear, no more anxiety, no more lust, no more greed, no more pride. Luke eleven twenty two 22 says, the robber seems successful until someone bigger comes in the room. You know, who lived in the promised land, Canaan? Goliath's family, right? And what they do, they send in 10 spies. And those 10 went in, and they went into the land, and they saw giants. They saw these grapes and the fruit of the land. They came back and said, man, the, the land is filled with milk and honey. We want to live there. We want to have houses and, and live in, in our community. We want to grow. We want, this, is, this is our promised land that God has given us. But I got to tell you, there's giants there. And they were so amazed by the giants that eight of the ten came back and they said, no way. I mean, these guys are huge. There's giants in the land. And if you would have been in our Wednesday night class, we learned about giants. Anyway, there's giants in the land. Why do you think 
that no one was willing to go into the promised land before Israel because only God, only God could let him in. Only God could overcome the giants. Only God could take down the Goliaths. Friends, I tell you, we trust in our armor too much. We turn it on when we sit in our lazy boy. We sit in front of it when we turn on our iPad. We look at it constantly when we're on our phones. We hear it when it's in the music that we listen to. We listen and are trained in the ways of the world and the smells and tastes and sights and sounds of it so much that our spirit is being neglected. We've got to turn the table. But I'm, I'm so glad to say that the battle belongs to the Lord. Our part is surrendering. 